Good evening and a very warm welcome on behalf of the Jewish Historical Society of England, Leeds Branch, and on behalf of Milim. This evening, our series of talks and presentations continues with our special guest, Professor Tony Kushner, and I'll introduce Tony in just a moment. Welcome to you wherever you are in the world. We have viewers tonight from Israel, from Canada, the United States of America, and from all parts of the UK. Welcome to you all. Please do ask questions. You can do this at any time you like by typing your question in using the Q&A facility on your screen. And as ever, we will try to get through as many of your questions as we can. Please also be aware of the chat facility. This allows you to send a message or a comment to all of the other participants on this webinar, should you wish to do so. Finally, this event is being recorded and will be posted on the Millim website at millim.org.uk in the very near future. Recordings of most of our past events are on the website, as well as details of our packed programme of upcoming events for which you can book tickets. And so to our speaker this evening. Tony Kushner is Professor of History and Director of the Parks Institute for the Study of Jewish non-Jewish relations at the University of Southampton. Educated at the University of Sheffield and the University of Connecticut, he was formerly historian for the Manchester Jewish Museum. Moving to Southampton to be the director of the Parks Institute in 1986, he has developed it to be one of the largest centers for Jewish studies in Europe. He is the author of eight books, and he is currently working on a study of Jacob Harris, a Jewish triple murderer in Sussex, 1734, and along with Dr. Amy Bunting, co-presents to the Holocaust, another work. He is co-editor of the journal Patterns of Prejudice and is deputy editor of Jewish Culture and History. Readers of the Jewish Chronicle Letters page will also now know that he is the self-appointed spokesman for the Minion Anti-Defamation League. Uh, maybe he'll tell us a bit about that uh, himself. Um, this evening, he's telling a family story beyond a Jewish yoke, the egg importers of Hull. Tony, fascinated to have you as our guest and over to you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And, uh... I wish I could explain the letter to the Jewish Chronicle about the Minions. I think best explain that I'm in a competition with my oldest brother to see who can get the most ludicrous letter published, and I think I'm winning. It's a great pleasure to be back with the Jewish Historical Society at Leeds. Uh, I'm really sorry not to be with you. Um, I've been there two or three times before, and it's been wonderful to, to share the hospitality and, and sheer pleasure of, of being there, and particularly with Malcolm. Uh, so great to be with you, if it, only virtually this time, and let's hope next, next year in, in Leeds. I'd also like to thank Nick Evans, who I think is with us, who is uh, in whole and off whole, um, who's been really supportive with the research for this talk. And um, several sort of millennia ago, um, in the pre-COVID time, I, I had a very pleasurable uh, stay with Nick where I did some of the research. So thank you, Nick. And I'm sure you'll have some good questions. So I'm, I'm also really chuffed that we've got such an international audience uh, today. And I think it's, it's sort of fitting for this talk, uh, and I'm, I'm fitting in, in the way I'm going to start it with um, this photograph, uh, which I can um, say is, is not a, a, a um, studio photograph, but is sort of the real thing. And it's, if you can't read the writings, it's from your loving father, and the date is the 28th of April, 1917, uh, and signed S. Gordon. So it's Egypt, 1917, and this is my great grandfather. And what I'm gonna try and explain tonight is sort of a family story, but also a sort of neglected story of Jewish immigrant uh, entrepreneurship um, before the First World War and after, and, and particularly during it, as we see here. So the first question is, how do you get to Egypt from or origins in Vladimir? 100 miles from Moscow. 
uh, and outside, as we can see very clearly from this uh, striking image outside the Jewish Pale of Settlement. So my great grandfather came from um, this part of, of Russia, which has a very, very small Jewish population. Uh, one that looks like it was somewhat in transit. It's very, very male dominated. Um, for a Jewish community. So it suggests that it, it wasn't very fixed and because of the, all the restrictions of the Tsarist regime, um, that's not surprising. So how do we get from, from the pyramids, um, from Vladimir, sorry, uh, Vladimir to, to the pyramids? And the answer um, is, or rather the, uh, what we learn from this is that we should always believe our grandma. Now, when I was 12, uh, Haida, I, uh, I think the thing I enjoyed most, which probably explains my career route afterwards, was not religious study, um, but a sort of roots project. So this is Manchester in 1972. And we were told to find out about our, our family histories. And so I interviewed my grandma. Uh, so this is the uh, the daughter of Samuel Golden, uh, and also my great aunt. And uh, I was, I think, surprised my family that I, I interviewed my great aunt, who was uh, notoriously not um, the most generous financially, and she gave me a crown as well. So I was very, very pleased with this. So um, this is my first attempt at oral history. My handwriting, for those of you who know me, hasn't improved. It's probably deteriorated. Um, and this sort of stuck in my head, but I just thought this is a nonsense, um, that my great grandfather went exporting eggs and onions to England from Alexandria. Um, then a slight, apart from the um, spelling mistake, um, slight uh, problem with, with the location, um, Palestine First World War. So this stuck in my head and uh, as I say it was this sort of roots project that I really enjoyed. Um, sadly uh, my grandmother died not long afterwards and my grandfather died um, some years before so I didn't really get to find out very much about uh, my family history from, from uh, my family itself. Uh, and here is, is my grandmother on the left, my mother and father on the right. Um, so my uh, grandma who had told me the story um, in 1972. So a few years ago, I decided, um, having rediscovered that oral history, that I would pursue this a bit further. And you know, was this a sort of, uh, totally misremembered story. Uh, and no, here um, is uh, the proof, if you like, of a naturalization um, application uh, from my uh, great grandfather, um, who uh, was applying for naturalization uh, before the First World War. Naturalization was uh, a relatively straightforward process if you could afford it. Uh, and for many of the Jewish immigrants of, the, uh, of Britain, uh, this was quite an expensive process. Uh, but in terms of being accepted for naturalization, it was very, very rare that this wasn't achieved. Um, so if we take an example, a uh, famous example of Harold Abrams, the uh, famous athlete, uh, the, the subject matter of Chariots of Fire. Uh, his father, uh, who was a slightly dodgy businessman, uh, moneylender amongst other things, uh, living in Bedford, applied for naturalization in I think the 1880s or maybe 1890s. And a very snooty uh, home office official saw, saw that he had some sort of criminal, minor criminal offenses um, and, he, and, and noted um, that uh, he claims that he's a Jewish businessman, but in, uh, sorry, he claims he's a businessman, but we know that he's um, a Jew moneylender. And yet in spite of all that snobbery and, and 
uh, impolite anti-Semitism, there was no, pro no problem. So criminal record, um, slightly distorting what he put on the form, uh, Harold Abrams' father still got naturalized. So there was no problem in the case of uh, Samuel Gordon. Uh, you can see already that he's got a, a, a large family uh, and uh, which will become relevant um, shortly, but also the confirmation that my grandmother uh, was in fact right, um, subject of Russia uh, and an egg merchant is married and has seven children um, residing with him. So, uh, and these naturalization forms, particularly I think before the First World War are really good sources of information. Um, you find out a lot about the integration of, of people from them. So his, the people he got references from, uh, interesting he chose non-Jewish referees, which I think is quite common again to show that sort of integration. Uh, and it, he, he's making the case as, as people would do that he's very rooted in Britain and he wants to make uh, his future here uh, and the naturalization was granted. So we know um, uh, that uh, that's what his occupation was. Before then, like many of the Jewish immigrants who came to Britain, uh, still large numbers, even in the period of mass immigration, were hawkers. Uh, they sort of moved from peddlers, but still hawkers, uh, many glaziers. Um, but he's um, a, ped a hawker or peddler of cloth. Um, and so it's a, a move in the 1890s, 1900s to a new occupation from, from sort of hand to mouth existence as a peddler uh, and into um, what is an international trade. And I'm going to try and explain how that happened. Um, and this is the reason I'm, I'm partly doing this research is that I'm doing a sort of alternative history of uh, Jewish peddlers. There's been a sort of tendency, that, and these are, I think, even though I have disagreements with the literature that exists, which isn't very substantial, um, I have agreement that the people, these peddlers were remarkable, very brave figures, um, eking out a living and going to, um, to faraway places. Um, I have a slight sort of criticism of the literature as a recent book um, by a great scholar of, of Jewish migration, Hazia Diner, which is sort of very much a sort of upwards and onwards um, process. And what I'm going to show is some of the slightly naughtier peddler, um, peddlers along route. And uh, Jonathan mentioned my, my work on um, Jacob Harris, uh, the triple murderer from Sussex, and, and he was described uh, as a peddler. Uh, I think he was also a smuggler and possibly a highwayman, but that's a different story. So it's, it's a, a sort of a different history of, of people who um, could often be slightly the wrong side of the law. Now, in, in this particular case, I don't think my great grandfather was the wrong side of the law, but as we'll see, he, he isn't, um, his narrative isn't a quite straightforward one uh, and more interesting for that. So um, how on earth uh, do you make a living from importing eggs from Egypt? Um, and as I've uh, sort of mentioned, um, my, uh, this research has been helped by Nick Evans um, in Hull. Um, and he sort of highlighted to me um, that something that I think for us is, is still somewhat surprising um, that Breakfast goods, as he put it, um, dairy and egg products um, were largely imported and often from some distance. Um, so we get um, sort of sense of eggs coming from um, a long, long way away uh, and, and dairy products as well from Denmark. Um, perhaps you need to watch out for on Wednesday night of those dodgy Danish goods. Uh, but also, um, as we'll see from from um, the Baltic and even more um, extreme in a way uh, from Egypt. So it reflects that uh, there wasn't really a domestic trade in eggs. There was some product in the um, particularly in the West Country uh, and some um, local produce of eggs that would come into the cities. But large scale uh, eggs were, were coming from abroad and this was not an industry that was particularly 
um, developed in Britain and wouldn't be really until after the Second World War. Um, yes, sorry, I was looking for my Danish butter and there we are. Um, it's a very nice uh, Danish butter made, producing um, um, and selling goods for us. So um, it seems sort of counterintuitive that you could make any money out of importing eggs from Egypt and get them in one piece to, to Britain. So, um, and also that this wasn't going to be the most hygienic thing to do. Um, and here's an indication partly of the size of the, of the market um, but also some of the dangers. So this is from the major medical magazine, The Lancet from 1906. Every year between November and March, some 70 million eggs are exported from Alexandria to London, Liverpool, Glasgow or Hull, um, besides three or four million which go to France, Austria and other countries. This export trade has been gradually growing during the last 10 years, though the foul cholera of last winter checked it very seriously. Now, fortunately, the epidemic seems to have collapsed and the egg the shipment are mostly bought in Upper Egypt from the incubating rooms, which have been in use in this country for hundreds of years. As the eggs are very stale before they leave Alexandria, it is surprising that merchants should be able to sell them on arrival in England and Scotland, but apparently any egg is considered good enough for cooking purposes. And that's dated Cairo um, March 4th. So, uh, it's, uh, it's already coming to the attention of the um, medical authorities that not surprisingly with that sort of movement, um, and I should explain that you know, the eggs getting to Alexandria, um, so here's um, the port of Alexandria um, at a roughly about that time, the eggs aren't um, coming from Alexandria, they're traveling overland, um, up to two weeks. So two weeks um, to get to Alexandria, and of course this is going to be in the incredible heat of Egypt, um, then some time to get loaded onto the ships, uh, several week journey, and then arriving in Hull. Uh, and we're, we can then sort of take it a bit further in terms of what happens to those eggs um, next. And uh, so, so I should also add that there is sort of design uh, processes where uh, the problem remarkably for the eggs is not so much that they get broken in their two week travel internally, but get um, more problematically when they're loaded onto the ships, to the steamships, but they devise ways of loading the ships. Um, and this is uh, an important trade, not just in, in Egypt, but also in the Baltic. So there's less breakage. Um, and then they, they travel their distance uh, and then arrive in, in the ports. And we have a description from um, Neville Goldrine, um, whose father, as we will see, was one of the key figures, uh, I think particularly important um, in developing that connection to Egypt. Um, Neville was um, born in Hull, his father um, was not, was born in, in, in Egypt. Um, and um, he explains what happened when they arrived um, um, in Hull. So this is in his memoir. It's a small part of his memoir. It's more about being a conservative in Liverpool, um, which um, I thought was a contradiction in terms, but certainly not. Uh, he was a councillor, quite prominent Tory councillor in, in Liverpool. Um, So just reading from his um, memoir, Life is Too Serious to be Taken Seriously. He remembers, uh, and this is the son rem remembering his father, the horse and drays carts bringing loads of crates of eggs, which were unloaded and the eggs placed in large vats, filled, I think, with lime to preserve them. Then when eggs were required for sale, they were literally fished out of the tanks uh, with nets, they had to be checked though to see if any of them were bad and so they were candled. This was I think an invention of a cousin. It was rather like a, um, a beer can with a hole in, cut in the side and a candle inside it. 
Each egg was held up to the light of the candle, and if there was any sign of a drop of blood or impurity, it was thrown away. And this is more to preserve not just the, um, the health of it, um, of the eggs, but also of the, um, the cash root. Uh, and then we have another memoir, and I thank Nick uh, very much for um, dishing this out. It's, an un uh, it's a sort of published memoir, but it's a very um, hand-to-mouth one. Um, and this is from um, Rita Greendale, um, I Should Live So Long, Short rec Recollections of a Long Life. And her father wasn't an egg importer, but he was a, a grocer. And one of the major products he dealt with um, were were eggs and the eggs came from Egypt. And she recalls Egyptian eggs arrived in long flat, flat, flat boxes containing 120 eggs. They were really cheap, about threepence a dozen, but people were proud and would not buy them. Father would, um, she says, would put the slightest of cracks in them and say to bring your own basin. He did not say they were English. On the other hand, he did not say they were not. Uh, and these eggs were very, very small. So. So you can see there's all sorts of uh, possibilities of them not being uh, the freshest of specimens um, and they were certainly not used in the way that we might have eggs for breakfast but they would be used in, in more general cooking. So there is um, not very much medical opposition to them. This report in, in the Lancet is, is a relatively rare one. Um, uh, so, um, but you know, this is three weeks, um, one week overland, maybe two, and then um, two weeks by sea. Um, and there wasn't, um, if we want to sort of have it fast forward, um, we've got, here we've got Boris Johnson, uh, always a um, man of integrity um, and consistency. Um, use British petition launch for supermarkets to use only UK eggs in pre-prepared food. Now, you know, before 1914, before 1939, 45, it would have been impossible to do this, um, but we now have a very large um, domestic industry, um, and one that is, is, is still somewhat um, barbaric in terms of, of animal welfare, um, but, but it, it's, a, it's a very large scale industry. Um, but there doesn't seem to be any sort of official opposition to the eggs coming in, only sort of a snobbery towards them, partly because the eggs were so, such of an inferior quality and size um, when they got here. So um, what I want to sort of talk about now is that this uh, wasn't just a sort of one-off industry. Uh, this was... Um, quite big business in Hull. And there are lots of companies, some of them um, rivals, some of them collaborating. Um, but it's something that's forgotten. Uh, in my part of the adopted world, um, in Bournemouth, it is said, um, and certainly isn't the case today, uh, where it's been raining, but uh, that the sun is best in Bournemouth. And that's because it's my son, the doctor, my son, the dentist, my son, the accountant. Uh, but it certainly isn't my son, the egg importer. Uh, now, many of these uh, egg importers made a very good business. Alas, my great grandfather did not, which is why I'm sort of sit, um, sitting at my uh, table in Southampton and not in the Cayman Islands. Um, unfortunately, um, the big opportunity uh, came um, that he started, um, Samuel Gordon, Gordon um, was in business with Morris Anus, uh, and uh, here in the uh, whole times, we have a note in mid 1900s that notice is hereby given that the partnership uh, hitherto established between Henderson Morris Anus and Samuel, Samuel Gordon, carrying on business as egg important at St. James's Street in the city and um, county. Kingston upon Hull and the style of the firm, the Hull Egg Supply Company has been dissolved by mutual consent as of from the 9th day of January 1907. All debts and uh, owing by the mid late firm will be received and paid by, the, um, by, by Morris Alice. So, uh, unfortunately for my 
grand, great grandfather, Mr. Annis, uh, was rather successful, and my great grandfather not so much. And there is a reason for that, which, um, or a possible reason for that, which I will come on to shortly. So, why Hull? Uh, why is Hull a suitable place? Uh, and so I guess that um, uh, I think. Uh, Location is really important, uh, especially for um, both the Baltic egg trade uh, and uh, for uh, the Egyptian trade. There are ships leaving at least uh, once every fortnight for Alexandria from Hull, but it also reflects that there is a, a group, a large group of sort of entrepreneur, entrepreneurially minded um, immigrants some of them are Jewish, perhaps the majority, but not uh, solely. So if I just read from um, trade directory um, from the 1900s, um, and uh, of that variety of egg importers, um, there they are. Uh, I'm not sure of the nationality of all of them, um, but uh, it's a mixture of German, Scandinavian, East European, so here are the Jewish and other egg merchants in Hull. Mr. Sparkle, uh, Joseph Reichart, um, German Karl Jensen, who I think was Norwegian, Adolf Nepal, uh, Mark Penelays, Gustav Reis, uh, Olsen, Tannenbaum, Insler, Kitchling, Fischoff, Garfinkel, Bar Barnard, Gelman, Shibko, Junotsky, Marx, Alter. Charles Goldry, Goldry um, Ryan, um, Lawrence Otto, Louis Get Jacobs, Maurice Schneider, uh, and so on, uh, and, and also including um, my grandfather. And, and there are many, many more names. Um, so this is a, a group of immigrant traders. Um, you could call them all right mix in the Jewish case of immigrants that come with next to nothing and, and become quite successful businessmen, but then we see them in this very sort of cosmopolitan environment of Hull, that there are um, a whole group of them, uh, and they're finding the gap in the market. Uh, and I think it's uh, uh, significant that, um, as, I, as this uh, slide shows, is that Goldrine um, was, was born in Egypt and that this may be in Cairo in 1891, naturalized in Hull in the interwar period, uh, and that perhaps it was through Goldrine that the connection to Egypt um, was made. So um, what seems a very unlikely trade route, um, it starts to become slightly more uh, sensible in the sense that there are good trade links, uh, shipping links to Alexandria in Hull. There is this group of entrepreneur or people looking for opportunities. There is someone who has got family connections um, to this sort of diasporic uh, and quite sizable community, particularly in the Alexandria Jewish community. Um, and from Hull, um, the eggs, and, and, and some of them going into, into Liverpool as well, uh, the eggs would be um, sent to, um, particularly to Jewish communities uh, around, and, and this is, it sort of connects us to Leeds. So um, there is a market for these eggs, and particularly there's a Jewish market for them. Um, and in spite of the, you know, these low value goods, um, and the enormous journey that they've been on, uh, they can still make a profit from them. As we'll see, that profit increases massively in the First World War. The other major place, um, uh, and here's sort of, again, sort of um, a, a lovely fitch, a photograph of one of the biggest companies, Max Minden, um, Jewish East, uh, East European company, uh, origin again, uh, and where we can see sort of the eggs coming off um, sort of hole in the ship um, and, and being straight into the, into the, to the lorries. Um, the other major part of place of import was the Baltic. Um, this is a photograph I, I took uh, just this afternoon uh, on a little trip out. Um, 
but here I think we got the explanation of why the Baltic uh, was both uh, was a potentially problematic place to import the eggs from. Uh, Baltic regularly freezing over and therefore the supply of eggs from the Baltic um, problematic. And so if you like, the Egypt market was um, supply was an alternative, a more reliable one, if, if not necessarily better one in terms of the, the quality and size of the eggs. But I think the Baltic um, connection is an interesting one in terms of sort of I th changing our mindset in terms of how we think of Jewish East European migration and looking at some of the foreign office files on this, I was quite surprised, taken aback by um, what these Jewish entrepreneurs were doing. They were using their linguistic and network skills in Eastern Europe, having settled in Britain for some time. So they've not severed their links with Eastern Europe, um, but they're also protesting to the foreign office about some of the restrictions to trade and the foreign office is, is following up on them. Uh, so uh, they, they are, in a sense, sort of telling the Tsarist regime what to do in terms of, uh, of, of, um, of trade. So, you know, again, we have this sort of fiddler on the roof image where there's a sort of long cinematic um, trail of migrants leaving and leaving for good. But we know that up to 10% at least of Jewish Eastern um, European immigrants returned before the First World War because their roots were, were so strong to Eastern Europe. Um, and that even those that didn't return retain family connections, but as in this case, trading rela relations as well. So the Jewish entrepreneurs, but not just those, the non-Jewish ones, and those in Germany and uh, from Germany and, and the Baltic uh, and, and um, uh, Northern Europe and, and Scandinavia had those connections as well. So Jews are prominent in the trade, but they're, they're not alone. But, that, but it shows again that connection, that strong connection to Eastern Europe before the First World War hasn't been severed. And, and it's interesting again that just that self-confidence of, of these Jewish entrepreneurs, that they're willing to sort of talk to the Foreign Office, and then um, even if they've got family still there, sort of say, look, we're really struggling here. Tell the, tell the Tsarist authorities this is making our, our task impossible. So, it again shows that there is something remarkable about these figures, um, that they are coming, settling quickly and, and just developing trade routes, which, which are astonishing in, in their sort of scale and ambition. In the First World War, the Baltic um, market is, is cut off and um, the Egyptian route becomes so important um, that a British government uh, department was set up. Um, this is a really exciting slide, isn't it? Um, visually very, very striking, um, but it is important. It's a, it's a beautifully bound uh, and uh, handwritten book, Minutes of the Meetings of the Advisory Committee on Eggs, which ran through the First World War. And it shows how seriously egg imports uh, were taken by uh, the the British government, the Board of Trade. Um, this was a, a really important um, for the, um, in, you know, in the world of, of, of shortages of the First World War on the home front, um, egg importing was really important. Uh, and what uh, many of the minutes are about are compensating the uh, big egg importers for their losses of, of, um, of um, when ships were, were um, sunk uh, and um, they were getting quite significant uh, compensation. So the value of eggs went up very, very strongly in the First World War. Uh, and some of these Jewish traders um, were uh, were some of the beneficiaries of that, which takes me back to um, my family story and Samuel Gordon. So he explains fully why he is in Alexandria in 1917, um, organizing the trade. Um, and this is where the, the paper gets, or the talk gets a little bit um, scurrilous. Um, I think it would make a wonderful um, script for a, for a film uh, of what was Samuel Gordon up to in Alexandria in 1917. Remember that he's got at least six children in whole. 
Um, I went to a family gathering um, in Bournemouth, uh, giving a, a talk and um, met my last remaining relatives uh, in, uh, who were living in Hull, uh, who told me a story about Samuel Gordon, uh, as if this was sort of common knowledge, which of course to me it wasn't, but my ears pricked up enormously when I um, heard whisper of this, that um, the story was that uh, uh, he had a Egyptian family, Muslim family in Alexandria, a sizable one at that. Uh, now this sounds absolutely absurd, but if we look at sort of patterns of Jewish migration and we look at say the Yiddish press, um, particularly in the States, it's full of deserted wives um, and people who are looking for their, particularly their husbands, uh, who have uh, either abandoned their family in Eastern Europe or in, in, in places of settlement like Britain. Um, now in New York, in the closeness of somewhere like the Jewish East Side, uh, Lower East Side, you could um, run some risk that you might be found, but in Alexandria, who knows? So, you know, how, how, is, this, how is this knowledge found? Um, and uh, there was a family dispute about the source of this knowledge. Um, it was dismissed by one person because the, the source of knowledge was a Jewish butcher uh, and that the Jewish butcher smoked. Now, you know, we do all sorts of work with our first year history students about how do you prove things? You know, what's the level of historical proof? Uh, but I've never heard that you know, a smoking Jewish butcher is all automatically um, not necessarily telling the truth. Uh, I think the smoking was, was, was notorious because um, people would get their kosher meat in whole um, with a, a little bit of ash added to it. So um, not the most, again, hygienic thing to do. Now it all seemed a bit absurd and uh, hearsay, um, but through some um, fortuitous um, matter, the, the butcher had a very unusual name and it was very easy to track him through government records that he was in the British Army in Alexandria in 1917. So his claim that he had seen Mr. Gordon with his Muslim wife and family in Alexandria in 1917 is not necessarily impossible. So we've got him pinned to the right place in the right time. He may still have made the story up, of course, um, but it's a very um, intriguing one. Um, But it explains perhaps why of all of these Jewish egg importers who are all and non-Jewish ones as well, all doing astonishingly well in the First World War, my grandfather um, returns to Hull and then gives up the trade and, and becomes a sort of small shopkeeper for the rest of his life. Okay, I'm gonna close it there. I really want to uh, hear what people think and if they've got any family stories and connections, uh, because I think this is a really neglected area, but important one. And it's, it, it's you know, given that we've written so much about Jewish immigrant life and their economic activities, um, I think it's, it's remarkable we, we don't know more. So I, I'm intrigued to, to hear anything from you about um, any stories or memories of, 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 this, of these very, I think, brave um, and industrious uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, before um, during um, before the First World War, during it, and, uh, and continuing in some cases right through to the Second World War. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. That was riveting. It was fascinating and um, uh, and, and very memorable uh, as well. Um, we have uh, one or two questions. Please put your questions on the Q&A now if you want uh, Tony to answer anything. We also have um, a few comments. Um, interesting comment from Carol Gold. Uh, Carol says, my paternal father, Charles Epstein, was an egg merchant living and working in Liverpool and is shown on the 1911 census as an egg merchant, but also owned a delicatessen in the heart of the Jewish community where he sold his eggs. Uh, she says, I have little information about his life other than that the family were from Germany. My father tells the story that as a child, he and his brothers would watch their father open a crate of eggs and pick out by sight any of the eggs that had gone off. The children would take the eggs out of the shop and crack them open and discovered that everyone was indeed bad. Now, I'm fascinated by um, 
the age of these eggs because uh, professionally I'm involved with food that's gone past its its date. And, and in anticipation of um, uh, your talk, I did look up the shelf life of an egg unrefrigerated. Um, in, in most countries, it's not allowed after about two days, but in actuality, an egg will keep between one and three weeks uh, without being in, in, in the fridge. Um, but your presentation uses the word stale. It doesn't say the eggs were off. And looking at what Carol has just said about eggs being bad, um, I, I wonder if there's a difference between an egg that's bad and an egg that's merely stale. I think the, the difference is um, from a marketing perspective <laughs> that you could possibly get away with a stale egg, um, but not necessarily with a, well, you couldn't get away with a bad egg. I mean, it, you know, it's the very fact that we have that as a sort of phase of, of abuse really. Um, is uh, yeah, so so I, I mean, stale is is a very generous way of putting it, and I think if you know, I think there's a difference between egg being slightly um, unfresh, I would say, and being off when it becomes a, a real danger and menace to um, public health, as, as Edwina Curry, no doubt, uh, talked to John Major about. Um, so it's yeah, uh, it, it's. Slightly euphemistic, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I, I am amazed that there weren't more outbreaks. I think there were local um, sort of salmonella and, and other sort of outbreaks. Um, but you know, to, it, pinning it down to the eggs would have been at that time was probably quite difficult. Um, so, uh, but it was. It's interesting from that memoir um, that I briefly referred to. It's a very informal one by Rita Greendale that. Um, you know, she remembers them being sort of literally the poor relations of, of the egg world, but that people, because they were cheap, which again sort of makes it so surprising that they could make a living out of these. You know, I suppose it, it's the scale again, and again that Lancet report, the tens of millions of eggs that are coming in. So even if the profit margin is tiny, you're selling a lot of eggs, um, it's okay. But they're, they're clearly not um, um, desirable eggs to have. We have a comment here um, from uh, Linda, um, Linda Mickler. She says a, a bad egg will smell really awful uh, and will be unmissable. So clearly, somehow these eggs survived in a form where they they weren't riddled with salmonella, and uh, it's quite it's quite fascinating. I think it possibly even um, uh, inspires some research into whether. Um, eggs that have been kept out of the fridge for a long length of time are actually really that dangerous. Perhaps they're not. Perhaps um, perhaps we're on the cusp of some great uh, discovery. Um, uh, Angela Cohen asks, where can you obtain copies of naturalisation uh, papers as my grandparents settled in Hull in the early 1900s? Okay, well, obviously, at the moment, it's not um, so easy, but a lot of, not all of them, but a lot of the certificates have been um, uh, digitised by the National Archives. The uh, longer ones tend not to be, um, but it would then be a matter of going to queue um, to National Archives. Uh, but their discovery website is brilliant. Uh, it also tells you records that aren't held at the National Archives. And you can refine that very easily. So uh, I've, I've sort of came light, late to life um, in my research career to sort of using the naturalization papers, but they're really interesting. They become slightly less so after the First World War when there are less of them. Um, but uh, they, they, they tell you a lot about the integration of, that, of the individuals. They obviously, you know, that people want to be naturalized. Now, you know, it was a good move to do it because uh, for those particularly, and some of my family were Galician um, as well, and that they um, suffered internment in the First World War as enemy aliens. But even those that were, were Polish um, in the interwar period who hadn't been naturalized, we had a very, very strong anti-alien regime, particularly in the 1920s, uh, where people were being deported for minor offenses, maybe uh, failing to report a change of address to the police, 
um, minor gambling or whatever, and some magistrates were notorious for deporting people. So it, it proved to be a good investment for a business person like Samuel Gordon. It's going to be very important um, to have that uh, that uh, stability from naturalization. So they not a, not all Jewish immigrants or, and others went that path after the First World War. It becomes very difficult, particularly um, the Home Office. Uh, starts to differentiate between immigrants and um, in, uh, in, not just in terms of coming in, which is almost impossible to do after 1918, but in terms of granting naturalization. And it does so on a very racial basis. So uh, those that are called Slavs, Jews and others um, are undesirable. We have, have to have a very, very strong case to, to make it. Um, so it's interesting that Gold Ryan does get naturalized in the 19th, I think, early 30s. Uh, but then he's a very successful business person. So, so they're great and, and they're, they're really good about, you know, they show you that they've got connections to non-Jews because they tend to use non-Jews as their referees. Um, you get waspish comments sometimes from the police, from the Home Office officials. Um, so it, it's, it's a very rich source, um, not all of them, um, but very easy to find out if they exist or not. And I say a lot of the certificates, which don't tell you an awful lot, but they tell you when, um, on, on just, uh, are just digitized. But the, the actual folder, uh, which can be, you know, like with Samuel Gordon, it's about 30 pages long. Uh, and they also give you, from a genealogical point of view, we've got information about Samuel Gordon's parents, about what they did. Um, so, you know, it's um, not, you know, the spelling and things aren't always accurate and the dates like with any like the census things you've got to be careful of accepting them as as absolutely accurate but they're a really rich source i think you mentioned uh nicholas evans um he has a question uh tony given uh we hear so much of anglo jewry did your family see themselves as british jews and is that a more usable term thanks nick and and um I think um, I mean, it's a good question because I think looking through and not, not in, in immense detail, but I get a sense that Samuel Gordon and I think his brother become part of a sort of Jewish establishment in, in whole in the 1920s, 30s. So they're not the most prosperous people, um, but they're sort of solidly, I suppose, lower low middle class. I mean, in terms of my grandmother, there's a sort of dowry for her um, to marry. Um, you know, not not in a again a sort of a, a Lithuanian Jewish tailor, so he's you know, she's she's not not a she's not going to be a great catch, but enough to give diaries. So they are part of a sort of new East European um, leadership, and I'm sure that they would have seen themselves as very Jewish, but also you know they, they've been settled in Britain since the 1880s. Um, so it's two generations, their children are, are born and educated. Um, I remember my, my great aunt and my grandma having you know, very strong uh, whole accents um, when we went to see them in, in North Manchester in the 60s, 70s. Um, and, and my great aunt still lived in, in Hull. Um, so, so that they were you know, very much part of the local world. Um, relatives that remain there, you know, very strong sporting identity with Hull in terms of rugby league, especially, but also football. So um, a very strong local identity, whether they would see themselves as connected to the Jewish elite in, in, in or mainstream Jewish community in London, probably not, because I think their identity was very Northern, very, even within that, very whole oriented. But within that world, they were, they were operating in the synagogue in, various um, sort of welfare groups. I did find one mention of my, one of my, uh, I think the brother of, of maybe, maybe Samuel Gordon and his brother were involved with helping trans migrants in the 1920s, um, when it was very, very difficult to settle in Britain, as I've mentioned, Britain had restricted entry so much from the free entry before 1905 to, to almost impossible to get in after 1919. And, uh, He's they're involved with helping those the gangs getting stranded in immigration control. It's very hard to get into America, situation in Eastern Europe desperate. So uh, they are still got that connection to poorer immigrants um, and to Eastern Europe, um, even though they're very much part of whole life. 
Um, Colin Lecce makes a statement. I hope I've pronounced that correctly, Colin. My parents had a grocery shop to check eggs. You place three eggs on top of each other. And if I recollect correctly, the middle one rotated if it was OK. So that's something everybody can try at home. Um, a comment from Abigail uh, Kaplan. I obtained naturalization papers of my great great grandfather by contacting Q. They posted uh, the copy to me, so it was all done virtually. So maybe that's something people can try. Uh, Michael Berman asks How large was the area of the distribution of the eggs that were landed in Hull? I think, um, I mean, I, I think I saw in the chat chat somewhere maybe um you know whichever ports well you know i've mentioned hull's got the advantage of, of sort of facing um north sea and and, and the east european market uh, but it's also got the advantage of, of having the, the, so many shipping companies with, with international links but liverpool is a rival um in the egg world and, and again I, I someone mentioned um, their family setting up in, in liverpool and that's where the goldrine family after uh, the uh, First World War, uh, or during the First World War, shift their enterprise to Liverpool. Um, so I think you've got a sort of almost a Jewish hinterland. So you've got the Jewish communities of, of Leeds, um, and it's not just a Jewish market. Um, that would be, you know, it's sizable, but it's perhaps not enough on its own. So I think um, certainly Leeds, and, and uh, which is a, a reasonable distance, and in, in Liverpool, I, I, I presume it would include Manchester as well. So you've got two large Jewish conurbations covered in the north of England there. Um, so between the two ports, you've got pretty much the north of England um, uh, market. Um, so, you know, yet more travel for the eggs. Um, and I'm sure, you know, a high percentage of them were not um, of the finest quality, whether they were dangerous. I think there are some outbreaks of, of, of um, uh, of extremes that sort of uh, stomach upset, shall we say, which, which would probably be linked. Um, but then there's other food that is equally problematic at this time. Uh, Malcolm Sender is asking about the production of these eggs. Were they produced naturally before today's hybrids? Um, Malcolm clearly knows a lot more about eggs than um <laughs> well i know is that um and i think it was hinted in one of the sources that you know this is a long-standing trade in um business in egypt so it's not something that an egyptian market develops to satisfy a western market um it's been and it's a very from what i've the limited amount i've been able to read about it it's a very not very much changes it's it's large scale um it's, I think, very traditional. Um, it's nothing, you know, its scale would perhaps make a parallel with, with the production of eggs today, but I don't think it's anything like the sort of battery system. Um, so I suspect it's a lot of very small farmers. Um, and then this sort of established route to get the, the, the eggs on road across Egypt to, um, to Alexandria. Eva Fromovich uh, asks, you, you, you mentioned uh, the, Balt the supply of eggs from the Baltic being uh, shut off uh, during the First World War. And Eva asks, does this egg shortage explain the invention of eggless custard during World War I? Absolutely. And I think, you know, in the Second World War, you've got sort of dried eggs as well. So which reflects, you know, that the reliance on the market and the um, the dependence in the First World War on the Egypt market, and then that becomes vulnerable because of enemy attack. So, you know, a, a ship goes down and the compensation figures are remarkable. It's thousands of pounds at 1915 levels um, being paid for, uh, for a whole... But if a, you know, a cargo goes down, that, that could be the supply ended for six months or something. So it's... Um, um, it's um, you know putting all, all your eggs in one ship or whatever. They, um, <laughs> yes, but it's you know you've got no choice. They can't. You know it's not going to work out having a small load of eggs. You know they, they're going in very big ships, and those ships are going to be quite vulnerable to attack. A couple of comments. Uh, Linda Mickler says, "I was born in Hull, 
uh, and I lived there until I married. My mother worked for an egg cracking company in Hull, and I did a summer job there when I was in the sixth form. This was in the uh, 1950s and 60s. The eggs were used in bakeries and so on. They were probably imported and many of them were bad or fertilized. Um, Arnold Zamansky says, you mentioned Mr. Fishoff as being an egg importer in Hull in the early 20th century. Susu Israel Fishoff had a successful family business in Gledhow Lane, Leeds, that handled a large volume of eggs. Our family bakery in Leeds, Zamansky Markman, used large quantities in the 1950s, 1960s. Back to the uh, First World War, Anne and Michael Crook uh, are interested in how the trade was sustained uh, when the Ottoman Empire was part of the enemy. I think with, with Alexandria being open as a port that you, you've got, um, you know, it's, it's again, it's a vulnerable supply. Um, but the eggs do seem to keep going right through the war and Alexandria and then British army base there. So you've got some security there, uh, but yes, it, it's not, you know, it's got all the problems with, uh, before the war of the distance uh, and the quality, but it, it's also got that added factor as well. So it's, um, you know, I, th I think you can, again, praise these um, entrepreneurs for the risks they're taking, but in the first world war, they've got, the benefit that they, they've got the state behind them if, if they lose their cargo. Um, uh, another question, do you know if the trade peaked just before Passover when eggs would be in demand uh, for the Seder meal and presumably for, for baking cakes and so forth? I think so, yes, because I think it is a very, you know, it's not exclusively, but I think there's a very big Jewish market for eggs. Um, and, you know, which is probably another factor in why there's a, as you know, that list of people shows that you know, probably half of, I think my sense, it's a little time since I looked at the trade directories, I think it becomes slightly more Jewish as, as you get closer to the First World War. Um, it's difficult to know this, this, without doing much more detail work about the size of the companies and there may be amalgamations. Um, but, uh, but there is, uh, it, be, it seems to me from the outside, it becomes more Jewish, um, uh, immigrant Jewish. And I think that does reflect it. And I think it also reflects that several of the comments about there being people that are both importing eggs and then selling them. I think we've lost uh, your... Oh, that's better. Uh, so, so, so they, you've got, you know, you're being able to import them, but also through delis or whatever, being able to sell them. So that this is, um, you know, it's a very Jewish aspect to this um, to this trade, and therefore the Jewish cycle of, of holidays would impact on it as well. And I, I think also it relates to Jewish cuisine and the egg perhaps playing a slightly bigger role. Um, I'm probably going to be shot down and say, no, that's not true, but, but certainly a, a Passover, yes, but I, I think more generally, perhaps. Um, uh, and it, I think most of the time these eggs are not, as I say, they're not going to be um, go to work on an egg sort of style of, 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 um, of, of a nice boiled egg. They're, they're going to be used in cakes and other cooking. So, um... We are out of time, but we will send you the, uh, the other notes in the Q&A, most of which are comments, and one or two are more personal uh, questions for you, which uh, obviously you can then follow up uh, at your leisure. So thank you so much for being our, our guest this evening. It's been a really fascinating insight into a subject which I imagine many of us know little or, or nothing about. Uh, to say thank you, we will share with you a bit of our own history this is Leeds and its Jewish community, a series of essays all about uh, our community here, which I hope you'll find of interest. And I'll also send you a book of my photography of Mug and David Adom uh, ambulances in action in Israel, which I hope you will enjoy uh, looking through. Now, let me, uh, let, me, let me tell our audience uh, about some of our upcoming events.
Next Monday, the 12th of July, we are joined by uh, another Tony, Tony Zendel, speaking about the golden age of dance, band, da dance bands and the very Jewish connections he has discovered in his book, Kosher Foxtrot. The following week on the 19th of July, we welcome American-born Israeli journalist Gershom Gorenberg. He is speaking about his book, War of Shadows, the cinematic story of the race for information in the North African theatre of World War II. Then on the 26th of July, Wendy Lower joins us from California to speak about her book, The Ravine, a 10 year long investigation into a single photograph taken during the Holocaust. And finally, for now, the 23rd, the 23rd of August sees Marielle Schindler telling us about her book, The Lost Café Schindler, a family memoir centred on one of Innsbruck's most famous institutions. We do have talks in the intervening weeks. Details will follow uh, very shortly. And our programme does now continue into September and beyond. So please visit milim.org.uk to sign up for our regular bulletin if you haven't already done so. All of our events are free, but you can make a small donation on our website to help support our work and the costs of providing these webinars. It remains for me to thank our guest, Professor Tony Kushner, once again. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all at a future event. Until then, stay